Here we go. Well, welcome back to all our students to STEM Friday. We are so honored to have our, our guest today, Dr. Schwartz. And I wanna introduce him by doing a direct quote from him. My work focuses on controlling the ways atoms and molecules come toward, come together to form more complicated and useful structures. All around us, we see that nature can build incredibly complex structures all on its own. And we study these natural methods of molecular self-assembly. So we wanna welcome Dr. Swartz, and he says we can even call him Dr. Jeffrey or just Jeffrey. Welcome, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass you the mic. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today and speak with all of you about some of my work. And even more than that, uh, hopefully answer some questions that you might have, either pertaining to the things that I work on myself or just any longstanding science or math or technology related questions uh, that happen to come to your mind. So please, please, please interrupt me and, and ask questions. I would, I would love that. But just to kind of get us started, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm working on in, in my laboratory and what I'm doing now and what I've done in the past. So in the introduction, you heard that I have worked a lot in molecular self-assembly. And what this means is basically studying the ways that molecules will assemble themselves into more complicated structures. And I, I do really mean how individual atoms and molecules just spontaneously on their own without us doing really anything to force it to happen Will, can create some very intricate, organized structures. And at first, at first glance, this might sound uh, strange or surprising. Like, what do you mean this happens all on its own? But actually, it's, it's very common in nature. A lot of biology, in fact, is built on this very idea of molecular self-assembly, that very simple, uh, sometimes extremely simple molecules will organize themselves to create more complicated structures. And so you can think of things like the cells in your body. They're made up, they, they are, are fairly intricate and complex and obviously are, are the building blocks of life, but they're made up of, of smaller molecules. And those molecules, there, there's, no, um, there's no assembly line or anything at, at, at that microscopic scale that's building cells one molecule at a time. It happens spontaneously all on its own. Or if there is anything akin to assembly line, the assembly line itself is made up of molecules that are assembling those molecules into something more complex, uh, such as in the case of DNA, where your cells have these very, in very interesting molecules that will break apart and reassemble DNA whenever your cells divide, for example. Uh, but anyway, we, we have learned to, learn to um, mimic the ways that nature spontaneously makes these, or these complicated structures to make something perhaps not as complicated as a, a living cell. We can't quite do that, but we can use some of the same principles to create structures. And so thing, things that I used to do would be to, would be to take these molecules and um, uh, to, to have them assemble themselves onto surfaces, onto a gold surface, in fact. And, and we use gold for a couple of different reasons that I'll get into in a moment, but they would create a very ordered, almost crystalline, layer, a single molecule thick on that surface. And that's useful for a couple different things. Number one, it helps us understand the self-assembly process better. If we can put it onto a very flat surface, it's easier, to, easier for us to look at later. Um, but also, we can use, use that layer to create different types of, for example, sensors. For example, if you wanted to sense, um, uh, detect a, a type of molecule in an environment, Maybe it's a maybe it's a, a contamination or, or um, uh, um, a pollutant molecule, for example, that you might want to detect. Uh, you can create a molecule that binds to that molecule and stick that uh, detection molecule onto a surface. And then when when the molecule you're trying to detect binds to that molecule, it can, can trigger some response when it when it absorbs to the surface, and we can we can detect it in that way. I mean that's a very very simple way of describing it. Um, but you can build all sorts of interesting sensors in, in that way by inserting molecules into this ordered structure on a surface. Now, I was I was all talking about how you, how we study this this process and putting onto a, onto a gold surface. 
Um, one of the big tools that we would use, one of the more common tools that we would use to study these things is called a scanning tunneling microscope, STM, scanning tunneling microscope. And this is a type of mollusk, mollusk, this is a type of microscope that enables to see individual atoms and molecules on a surface. It needs to be a flat surface because um, when you're looking at things that have, when you're looking at bumps on a surface that are the size of, of atoms and molecules, you want to be able to see, you, you want to be able to see them clearly. And if your surface is extremely rough, then um, that roughness can, can um, make it harder to see the, the atomic size bumps. So in other words, you want to be very smooth and the only bumps you see are the atoms. But that's actually surprisingly easy to do. You can create atomically smooth gold surfaces. And we use gold because uh, of some very convenient chemistry that some of these molecules bind to gold um, in a very easy way. And then we can use this, this microscope. Now, the microscope does not work anything like a optical microscope that you might be familiar with already. An optical microscope uses, uses, optical, uses light, light that we can see with our, our human eyes. Um, but that will not work when you're interested in seeing atoms and molecules. They're far, far too small for that. Uh, so you have to use a, a different type of microscope. And that's this STM microscope I'm talking about. It works using uh, a very small current of electricity. So how it works is you have a flat surface, and that's represented kind of by my hand right here. And you get a very sharp, atomically sharp, if possible, needle. And you put it very, very, very close to the surface. And you apply a voltage between the needle and the surface. And even though the two are not touching, uh, because they're so close, a very small current will flow between the two, an electric current. And if you move that needle around as it moves back and forth across the surface, the amount of current that's flowing changes. And that the amount of current depends on a couple different things. It depends on the separation distance between the needle and the surface. It depends on what's, what's in that gap. So is it, is it vacuum? Is it some molecule? Is it something else? What's in between also affects the current. Um, and so as you move it back and forth, you can detect changes in the amount of current. And we can relate that change in current to the topography, how rough the surface is. Again, even if the roughness is just on the scale of atoms and molecules. And so moving, moving the needle back and forth, back and forth, left and right, up and down, you can create a map of where all the bumps on the surface are, even if the bumps are just atoms and molecules. And you can create very intricate, very beautiful, in my opinion, uh, images of atoms and molecules. And you can see exactly the atoms and molecules that you're interested in studying. You can put that needle over a molecule and zap it with electricity or, or poke it and pick it up and move it somewhere else and put it down. And you can even build structures atom by atom in this way. It's a very slow process. It's not really practical if you want to mass produce something. But if you're interested in doing the most atomically precise experiments you want to imagine, that's, that's one way to do it. There are other types of microscopes out there that enable us to, to see extremely small things. Um, electron microscopes, for example, might be something you've heard of, and I'm happy to talk about those. But I do want to take a take a break right here and just uh, ask if there's any any questions um, in the, in the audience, either about what I'm just describing or other things that pop into your mind. I don't really have any questions. I've heard about like the microscope where you can like do it over a flat surface and you can see um, like the individual atoms like through the bumps that they have. I learned that in science class, but it's interesting to like keep learning about it here. Oh, that's awesome. Not, it's not very awesome. It's not very common that I come across people who, who have learned about this type of microscope before in their, in their science classes. So that's really great. Um, yeah. So uh, speaking, of, speaking of the bumps in the surface and the, and, the, and the needle, there is another type of microscope that works in a similar way to what I was just describing, except instead of using electric current like the STM uses, it basically is, is like reading Braille on a surface. So again, you have a sharp needle and um, you come in get really close to the surface and you can basically either touch the surface or just tap it over and over, tap it really fast. Back, um, and uh, you can move it back and forth and you can feel just based on the force, on the feedback of the force pushing onto the surface where those bumps are. So that's called an atomic force microscope. And that's another really common way to, to, to image these type of things. And you can even do both at the same time, which is like, I think that's really cool, is you, you can do atomic force microscopy and scanning tunneling microscopy at the same time. And so you can see with incredible precision, not just the atoms, but the like the electron orbitals around the atoms. So I'm not sure if you've learned about those in your science class or not, but you know, um, 
some of the, some of the simplest ways we think of atoms is we'll think, okay, there's a nucleus in the middle, and there's the electrons moving around, kind of like planets around the sun. Well, when you get a little bit more advanced, you realize, well, that's actually not not the case. The, these electrons are not really moving around like planets. They're they have specific orbitals they like to move in, and those orbitals can have very weird shapes. You know, sometimes they're spheres, which are you know nice symmetrical shapes, but sometimes they look like dumbbells or toruses, which are basically like a donut. Uh, and anyway, so they can have pretty complicated shapes, and you can see that with this combined STM AFM measurement. Uh, it's it's really cool to see that, and you can you can image where the electrons are around the atom. So um, there is another type of micro electron microscope. Uh, so it works very different from from this kind of uh, needle based. So so these these microscopes that use the needle, uh, those are broadly speaking, generally called a, a scanning probe microscope. Basically, you have a probe, a needle, that moves around. You scan that probe around to take an image of the surface. Um, there is an SEM, scanning electron microscope, that uses a beam of an electron. Basically, you have an electron gun, and you shoot the electrons toward the sample. And if you shoot them at relatively low energy, and in this context, low energy means maybe a few hundred or a few thousand volts, the electrons will hit the sample and bounce off, and then you can measure those electrons as they bounce off the sample, much in a way that you might uh, measure light that bounces off the sample. So with a conventional optical microscope, you shine light, light bounces off, and you collect the light with a lens. You can focus it onto a, either maybe a CCD camera or even your, your retina and your eye, and you can see the object directly like that. Well, in the skinny electron microscope, the electrons bounce off, and you can collect those electrons with a lens, not an optical lens, but an electromagnetic lens. It has electric and magnetic field to focus them to a particular spot, and you can either focus them to a camera or, uh, well, you can't focus it to your eye. That would be a bad idea. But um, you, could, you could see the image that's projected on the camera in that way. If you use a lot more energy, not a few hundred or a few thousand volts, but a few hundred thousand volts, the electrons don't just bounce off the sample. Uh, some of them will even pass straight through the sample. And in that case, you can project basically a shadow of your sample down onto a detector below. So you, have your, you, you, know, you might have your, your, uh, your sample in the middle, electron guns above, shooting electrons down, and then below, you're basically casting a shadow. But the shadow that you, you cast is basically the shadow of the atoms that are blocking the electrons as they pass through the sample. So you can see atomic shadows, and I just think that's awesome. Um, and if you rotate your sample different, different directions, sometimes the atoms will line up in just such a way that they'll all be in a nice row. You can see the nice galleys between the atoms when they're all lined up and you rotate a different way. You, um, you can see the, the crystal structure of the material very precisely, very precisely. Um, so what else is, is interesting to you all? I don't really know much about um, the the field. I mainly just knew about the the microscope, and then I know, like, I took chemistry, so I know the orbitals and how the amount of energy that the atom absorbs also affects which orbital the electron is on, um, and uh, like, different atoms have different number of protons, and those create like and neutrons and the different number of neutrons creates like isotopes of the same type of atom. But uh, other than that, I'd be interested in learning more about those. That's, that's great. And you just mentioned a very important thing about, um, well, a couple, couple things in combination. So one is that, you know, different, different elements have different protons in the, nucle in the nucleus. And uh, protons, of course, have a positive charge. And so they're gonna pull on the negative, negatively charged electrons. And the more protons you have, the stronger that pull is. And so the, the effect of this is that uh, the, those orbitals around the atom are going to have different energies depending on what element you're, you're talking, about, talking about. Hydrogen will be different energies than helium, will be different than lithium, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, each orbital within a, within a given element is going to have a different energy. So we can use this to our advantage um, while you're doing this SEM experiment, the skinny electron microscope experiment, you're shooting electrons at the material, right? Some of them are bouncing away, some of them are passing through. Sometimes what will happen is an electron will hit an atom and, uh, you know, maybe more precisely, it will, it will hit an electron and give that electron energy. 
an electron will move from one of the lower orbitals with, le with uh, uh, less energy and move up to an to a outer orbital with more energy. And then when that happens, uh, it eventually can decay. And, and some of that energy can be released again as it falls back down. And the amount of energy just, um, uh, it just so happens to be that the amount of energy that it corresponds to typically is, is X-ray energies. So these are, these are much higher energy than the visible light that we can see with our eye, even, even ultraviolet lights, higher energy than that, but they're you know, roughly X-ray energies. So this would be you know, a few thousand electron volts worth of energy. Um, still small by you and my standards, but for an atom, that's a lot. Anyway, they'll, those X-rays fly off and, and we can collect those with the X-ray detector. And because the energy is very precisely set by the, by, um, the, the energies of those, those electron orbitals and the type of element that we're talking about, we can, we can measure those X-rays and know what element released them. And so if you have a sample that's made up of a bunch of different elements mixed together, you can, you can collect all those X-rays that are coming off of it and you can, you, can you can tell what the sample is made of. You can say, oh, it's 25% carbon, 15% oxygen, 20% you know, nitrogen. You, you can measure those, those X-ray energies and know what it's made of. And you can, and of course, as you move that electron beam around and scanning different parts of the sample, you can say, oh, there's more iron over here, there's more carbon over here. And so you can map out where all the elements are. And that's a very powerful technique. So that, um, oh, someone has a question. Is the graphene material also nanotech? Yes, it is. So graphene, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a, is a single layer of carbon atoms. Uh, there are a couple different common forms of, of carbon we encounter in our everyday lives. Maybe the most common is, is graphite. So graphite is the stuff in pencils, right? You write with it and you drag the pencil across the paper and you leave a mark. Well, the mark you're leaving is as you're dragging, as you're dragging the pencil across the paper, you're leaving away flakes of little tiny bits of graphite. And if you do it in just a special way, uh, then you can actually have a single single atom thick flake of graphite and that's called graphene. And graphene has very interesting properties. People are super excited about graphene and have been excited for about 15, almost 20 years at this point um, because it has very interesting electrical properties and magnetic properties and heat transfer properties. It's, it's, very, it's very special um, if you can isolate a single, single flake of graphite, graphene. Uh, it's very mechanically strong, et cetera, but it's also very optically transparent. And so the people who actually discovered how to do this, how to get just a single flake of graphene, did it in an almost laughably simple way. They had a nice crystal of graphite and they just put a piece of tape on it. They rubbed the tape onto the surface and they peeled the tape away. When you peel the tape away, you will peel away uh, a small number of sheets of graphite. And if you put another piece of tape onto that and peel, 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 and you can, you can peel it down thinner and thinner every time you do this. And after a couple iterations of peeling, you can get down to just a single, single atom thick sheet of graphite. And you can do, you can hook electrodes up to that and run current through it and, and uh, try to measure its properties. So, uh, and they got a Nobel prize for that. <laughs> um, so, I, oh, if, did someone else ask a question? There's stuff in the chat here. All right. Um, so please, if there's other questions, please ask them either verbally or in the chat. Um, now, we were just talking a moment ago about using the, the energies of the, uh, the x-rays that were coming off material to determine what that is. And that is a type of what's called spectroscopy. Basically, you're looking at the, um, the energy or the color of something that's being emitted um, and using that to determine what it's made out of. So that is a form of x-ray spectroscopy that we were just talking about. But more generally, there's a lot of different spectroscopies that use, uh, use light, either visible light that we can see or infrared light or other forms of light that we can't see. And another thing that I pretty commonly do in the laboratory is uh, use infrared spectroscopy to understand what's happening at, this, at the nanoscale. So um, infrared light is, of course, light we can't see. It's, it's beyond red. It's invisible to us, but it's still very much there. And um, different materials will absorb different 
colors of infrared light. I say colors in quotation marks because you know it's not really a color, you can't see it, but uh, different wavelengths of infrared light. And different wavelengths will different materials um, vibrate in different ways. The, the energies of atomic and molecular vibrations are on the order of infrared light. And so you can, you can figure out, oh, well, this material vibrates in a certain way because it absorbs this, this color of infrared light, this wavelength of infrared light. So what I have is a very high power infrared laser. It's high, it's high power that if you were to get this into your eye, you would just instantly go blind. You wouldn't even know you made a mistake. So obviously you have to be very careful around this, but we have these, these special laser safety glasses we wear that will absorb all that infrared light uh, so that it protects our eyes, which is great. And we also take other precautions, like we keep the beam always inside of a, a box, a light proof box. So you know we're, we're safely um, uh, away from the infrared light, but we can shine this high power laser onto the material and focus it down and get very, very intense. And we can actually make the material very hot momentarily because the laser will pulse. It pulses on and off, pulse on, pulse off. And when you pulse the laser on, the material will get very hot very fast and expand. And we can actually, we can actually measure that, that expansion of the material directly. And that's another way of uh, measuring the, the, the spectrum of a material is, is indirectly through its thermal expansion. And there are also ways that you can, you can use this intense infrared light uh, as a way of, of um, sending, sending signals through material. So some materials will not absorb the light, but will actually trap the light. The light will, will continue to propagate through the material uh, as, as though it's trapped. And you can see, an, you can see a, a visible analog to this if you have, say, a, a, um, a glass prism. Maybe you have a glass prism and a laser pointer. And there's a certain angle that you can shine that laser pointer into the glass prism that it will experience something called total internal reflection. So the, the laser pointer goes into the glass and it will hit the top surface of the glass. And if you get it, if you get the angle tuned just right, it will actually reflect off the top surface instead of passing out of the glass into the air. This also happens like with water and swimming pools or aquariums. So you can maybe look into a um, fish aquarium if you angle your head just right, so you're looking at the top surface of the water from underneath at just the right angle, you'll actually see a reflection. Anyway, so that's, that's this analogous um, way of trapping light. If you have this material, you can shine the laser light at just the right angle, and it'll actually bounce around there. And in that way, you can, you can uh, confine the light into very, very small volumes, uh, smaller than you would normally be able to focus it down to with lenses. Uh, one of the uh, one of the limitations of visible light is, uh, or, or this, is, this is true for, for conventional optics with lenses in general, is you cannot really focus the light down to a spot smaller than approximately half of its wavelength. So for visible light, uh, the wavelength is roughly 400 to 700 nanometers. So let's call it 500 nanometers just for a nice easy number to talk about you're limited to roughly that size, a few hundred nanometers of the smallest size you can focus that, that spot down. And that's even if you have the best optics available. You, money is no object. You go out and buy the best things available. Any company wants to sell you and you're not gonna do better than that. And you know, a few hundred nanometers is small, sure, by you and my standards, but um, it's huge compared to an atom. So if you wanna do something really at the smallest scales, you need some other way to focus in the, focusing that light down to a smaller size. And using these materials that can trap the light inside of them into a very, very small volume, uh, smaller than what you're diffractionally limited to be able to do, uh, then that's, that's one way of achieving that. And I was talking about infrared light. Infrared light has, has wavelengths much longer than the visible light that we can see. So if we were talking about a few hundred nanometers for visible light. Well, for infrared light, it could be a few um, uh, hundreds of, of microns sometimes. Uh, so a thousand times, thousand times larger. And this is actually the reason why you can't use an optical microscope to see things at this small scale because, uh, because of this um, limit of how small you can focus, focus the light or it's sort of the reverse problem where I was just talking about how you focus light down to a spot. Well, it's, it's the same thing. If you have a very small object emitting light from a spot, how well you can focus the emitted light. 
and it will just come out, it'll just come out blurry if the object is, is too small. You won't be able to see the true size of it. Um, so now that we're crossing into the into the regime of lasers and optics, um, there's there's some other stuff that I'm working on. It's a uh, it's relating to waveguides. And so basically these are kind of like wires for light, where in conventional metallic wires for electricity that you're probably familiar with, you know, you have a wire, you apply a voltage to it and electricity will flow through and electricity flows through the wire. Um, that, is, that is the basis of a lot of uh, modern electronics, of all of modern electronics is you have some wire, maybe it's a very small wire, uh, but you apply a voltage and current flows through it. Um, but there's some limitations with this. One is that you're limited in the frequencies at which you can transmit through the, through the wire. Uh, that when you try to turn on and off that voltage faster and faster, you get that current to flow um, at higher and higher frequencies. Uh, eventually you'll come to a point where the wire becomes very lossy, that it's, it's, it will absorb uh, a lot of that energy and won't transmit it so well. But one thing that, that is very good about transmitting information at very high frequencies is light. And we want to transmit things at high frequencies because that enables us to transfer information quicker, faster. If you want a, a higher bandwidth internet connection, for example, uh, uh, a fiber optic connection is much faster than a, a wired connection, right? So if we can move data transmission to, to optical signals, that gives us a speed boost. It also gives us a potentially an energy efficiency boost as well, because now we can transmit at very high frequencies and at low losses that we could not get with electrical signals. Uh, and so that may allow you to have a, a very fast energy efficient computer. The trade-off, however, is because basically anything you want to do with light tends to be bigger than things you do with electrons, uh, you sacrifice some of, the, some of the size, things get bigger. But the idea is that you can get enough of the material, uh, you, can get, you can get enough of a benefit by going really, really fast that it's okay if things are a little bit bigger. Um, and it's just about trying to find the right application uh, for each, each use domain. So you might have some server set up that can go really, really fast with, with optics, but in the case of things where you want it to be small, maybe a cell phone that you keep in your pocket, um, use, use electronics for that. Sort of depends on the application. So um, what else catches your fancy? What else can I talk about? <laughs> So um, in the context of spectroscopy, this is a super, super powerful technique. And a lot of what I was talking about, uh, these are experiments that you might do on the bench top, you know, in your laboratory, maybe even in your, in your, in your house, you know, there's, these are, these are um, this, is, this is very tangible things. You have some material that you can hold in your hand, maybe a very small material that you can hold in your hand, but nevertheless, something that you're holding in your hand or you know, close by. But the same exact technique of, oh, uh, uh, I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, the same exact technique of spectroscopy can also be used and is, is commonly used to study the biggest things in the universe that are super far away from us. So astronomers will do the same thing, right? They'll look at the, the you can never hope to hold a galaxy in your hand, right? And with our current technology, we can't even really travel very far outside of our own our, our own planet. We've just barely been able to leave our solar system with unmanned probes. But if you want to know what a galaxy is made of, hundreds or thousands or millions of light years away, we can't go there and touch it. But we can look at the light that's travel that's traveled all the way to us, and study its colors to know what that galaxy is made of. And so that's the way that we know what distant stars and galaxies and basically everything in the universe is made up of, because we can look at that light, compare the colors of that light, the things that we can test here on Earth, and we know, oh, everything's made out of the same stardust, so to speak. Um, and in that way, we can, we can infer a huge amount of stuff about the universe that we could not really test directly. Now, there was a question here asked, is it important for new computer chips and also 5G or 6G internet? 
So um, most computer chips these days are purely electronic. But when it comes to high-speed data transmission over long distances, increasingly that is moving toward uh, optical optical data transmission. So more and more fiber optic cables are being laid in the ground. They replace the old copper wires that are transmitting data long distances. So although it does vary by region, and you know different different service providers may have upgraded or not depending on um, where you live, uh, it's very possible that your cable TV, your internet, your phone is coming through fiber optic tape cables, and then is converted from that into an electronic signal to, as it goes into your house. Also, is this tech complete one uh, material group? I haven't talked a lot about this um, yet, but uh, that one of the big aspects, one of the big topics of study right now for for scientists such as myself and my colleagues is um, discovering new materials uh, and and testing their properties. So there are there are materials like graphene, for example that have only recently been isolated, a single sheet of graphite. Uh, and there's other materials that are analogous to this, not made of carbon, but made of other materials, right? And we're only recently been able to isolate them down to single atomic sheets. And these materials are, are basically a, a, a wide open playground for us to, for us to study because they're, they're brand new essentially to us at these, at these scales. They have new interesting, interesting properties when you get down to these scales. And not just the materials themselves, but we can combine the materials with each other in new, new interesting ways. So for example, you might take a sheet of graphite, graphene, and you stack some other material on top of it that's not graphite. Uh, so for example, just off the top of, off the top of my head, um, molybdenum disulfide, right? That's another material that's just like graphene, atomically thin, but it's made up of um, these, this other compound. Right, you can create these these structures of one material on top of another material in different combinations, different twist angles, and they will behave in different ways. And we can we can uh, study them, and they will have different unique properties that can apply to electronics, photonics. Um, possibly, you know, you can incorporate it into clothing. You might have clothing that's that's um, sewn with these materials into the fabric that you can you can transmit small electrical signals through your clothing to make it like a smart shirt or something. Um, there can, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe there's a computer in your, in your shirt, for example, or it will sense uh, the small amount of sweat or something on your skin, and it can infer medical information from that, your stress level or different hormones, um, depending on the, the, the small molecules that are, that are released on your skin. I know that spectroscopy can be used to discover elements Make up stars. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I think that's really phenomenal. That this you can use it the, the small scale bench top and also the biggest scales in the universe. Let's see. I know that uh, the universe began with the Big Bang, and then I learned this in science class again. But like, and then over time, quarks were created, and then the quarks created protons and neutrons, and then eventually electrons, and that the universe only became transparent with the creation of atoms because less light was able to be absorbed because the atoms like restricted how much the electrons could absorb, so more light was able to travel. And then also um, how like the fusion within the core of a star and gravity, like they create an equilibrium because gravity pushes against like the core of the star and then um, the fusion pushes to make this star expand but they reach an equilibrium and I think that's really cool. Oh I agree I totally agree. Um, be before I actually got started in in my current you know nanoscience world I actually really wanted to be an astrophysicist and study study supernova and you know things like this black holes I thought I thought that was also very cool to, to get into um, but yeah a, a, um, what, um, building off of, of something you were just mentioning about the transparency of the universe, um, I think I think that's um, uh, how do I say this? You can you can kind of understand that process based on where where the charged particles are located at any moment in time throughout the 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 history of the universe, right? So today, 
uh, the material that, that makes up the universe, you know, the matter, is in mostly in the form of, of atoms. And so the electrons and protons are kind of bound together, and there's there's these atoms. And yes, you can excite the you can excite those uh, excite the electrons. You can shine ultraviolet light or X-rays or something, and you can you can create a an electronic transition. But for the most part, um, it's now cooled matter well, to some extent. Uh, and there's also these vast regions of the universe that are empty, mostly empty. And so we can see through it very easily. We can see millions of millions and millions of light years away, billions of light years away, really, uh, because there's these big holes that we can look through and the material that's there is, is fairly transparent. But if you go back in time, you know, stuff gets closer and closer together, obviously more cramped, but nevertheless, mostly transparent. You go back far enough in time and now things are hot enough that those electrons and, and protons are not bound together in atoms. Now you have this plasma, this, this soup of charged particles moving around not bound together in atoms. And that is in some ways analogous to say a piece of metal today. So you've got a piece of metal, I don't know, aluminum foil, a sheet of copper, whatever you want. You can't see through that piece of aluminum foil, can you? It's shiny, right? You shine light on it and it doesn't, doesn't penetrate through. Um, and that's because there's a lot of electrons in that aluminum foil. It's a, it's a good conductor. And when the, electric, when the electromagnetic field of the light hits that good conductor, what happens to the electrons in the conductor? Well, the electrons in the conductor want to move with the field, right? And so they see this electric field coming in like, oh, hey, I want to move with that. And so uh, they end up blocking that electromagnetic field from penetrating into the metal. I mean, it, it moves a little bit into the metal, a tiny, tiny bit, but it's mostly blocked and reflected. And that's because aluminum is a great, con great conductor. There's electrons that can very easily move around in response to the field. But if you were to shine a high enough frequency of light onto that aluminum, uh, the electrons, as fast as they can move, can't move fast enough to counteract, counteract that field. And so if you go to a high enough frequency, you can see through aluminum, you can see through copper, um, but it just requires you to go to very, very high frequencies. And so when it comes to the, the universe and the Big Bang, um, you know, you go back far enough in time and now you have this plasma. Uh, and so the optical light that we want to look at it with, uh, visible light to us, infrared, et cetera, can't really penetrate through. But um, uh, yeah, that's just the consequence of where those electrons and uh, are are bound up within the universe and the temperature of the universe at that moment in time. You also mentioned uh, the different some different subatomic particles beyond just protons and neutrons and electrons. Uh, you mentioned quarks, and so I'm not sure how much you've heard about something called the standard model, but uh, no, this is new to you. It looks like okay, well. You know about the periodic table. The periodic table just arranges all these elements, right? You know, hydrogen, helium, et cetera, into a nice ordered table that organizes them based on their properties, based on how many electrons they have and their chemical properties, et cetera, rows and columns. Well, I like to kind of think of the standard model as sort of the analogous form of this for the, um, for the uh, fundamental particles, subatomic particles. Uh, a proton neutron, you can break those apart into quarks. And so there are different types of quarks. There are top quarks and bottom quarks. There are up quarks and down quarks. There are charm quarks and strange quarks. It's kind of a weird name, but that's their names. Um, and so there's, there's six different types of quarks. And so protons and neutrons are made up of top and bottom quarks, or no, sorry, sorry, up and down quarks, I mean, up and down quarks. So a proton is two ups and one down quark. A neutron is two downs and one up quark. Electrons, are, as far as we can tell, funda fundamental particles. You can't break an electron down into any smaller bit. So, um, uh, saying something, I can't hear you, but uh, the, you, you, the, the, the standard model, if you look this up online, you're, basically you're gonna find a chart and it's gonna have all these different particles organized on them. You're gonna have different types of quarks, you're gonna have the electron, um, and you're gonna have a few other uh, exotic particles that probably you're not too familiar with. Uh, so one of them is going to be the um, different types of bosons. So there's the Higgs boson, for example. There's the W plus and W minus boson. And these are fundamental particles that are related to other forces in other, other, other physical forces. So um, uh, the photon, for example, is one, one of these particles. The photon is the mediator of electromagnetic force. So um, 
you know, if there's an electromagnetic interaction between particles, proton and neutron, for example, that, that pulling an attractive force or a repulsive force is mediated by photons. Um, there is a hypothetical particle called the graviton that mediates uh, gravitational forces. The W bosons mediate the nuclear forces. And the Higgs boson is thought to be responsible for thing, giving things mass. There are other particles called neutrinos. And these are incredibly light particles, maybe even massless particles that can travel very, very fast. And they are emitted and absorbed in nuclear reactions. So for example, if you have a nuclear reaction where um, say a, 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 a beta, beta decay event, so an electron or a, a radioactive atom gives off an electron, it also gives off a neutrino. And we actually discovered this uh, particle theoretically before we even could discover it experimentally because people, people were looking at these, hey, where are all these, these beta particles go? Beta particles are just electrons. Uh, when, this, when this atom decays, it's given off an electron, there's momentum in one direction. Let's measure the momentum in the other direction because there's this law of conservation of momentum. The initial momentum needs to be equal to the final momentum, right? So if you measure the final momentum of the radioactive daughter decay particle and the electron, you add that up, it didn't quite equal the initial momentum. And so there is a huge problem in physics. Oh, is our law of conservation momentum wrong? Or are we just missing something? And at this point, we were pretty confident the law of conservation momentum should be correct. We were pretty confident experimentally about that. So we thought, oh, well, there must be something that we're missing. And so there's this theorized particle called a neutrino that was also given off that also carried away some small amount of momentum. And it took a long time because they're hard to detect, but we eventually found neutrinos. And now there are these neutrino detector experiments uh, that, are, that are typically located deep, deep underground in old mines. For example, I think there was a really big one in Japan where they have a deep, deep mine shaft and they filled it with uh, this dry cleaning fluid that happens to be very good at detecting neutrinos. And um, on the rare occasion that some neutrinos pass, pass into this uh, giant pool of liquid, it will emit a little flash of light and we can detect that light with a camera and we know that a neutrino hit. The reason why they need to be deep underground for these experiments is they're trying to detect solar neutrinos. Neutrinos are coming from the sun. And um, neutrinos do not really interact very much with most material. They, they, they're all over the place, but they typically just pass straight through stuff. And so really to have any chance of interacting with them, um, it's a deep underground with this giant pool. And it doesn't really matter if it's day or night where the sun is, because the neutrinos will just pass through the entire Earth. If, if, if the sun is on their side, they'll go through the entire Earth before they, they will interact with this pool. And, and, and occasionally, we'll get a flash of light and detect these neutrinos. So those are other kind of less commonly known objects that are part of the standard model. Uh, but these are, these are the fundamental particles that make up everything um, in different combinations. And they themselves make up the protons and neutrons that make up the atoms that make up the molecules that make up everything around us. Um, as long as I'm talking about very exotic stuff, uh, there, uh, there, there's, there's uh, some stuff called dark matter and dark energy in the universe. And this is, this is distinct from this, the things that we can see. So ordinary matter, matter that we can see and in some cases touch, um, only makes up around 5% of the universe as far as we can see, only 5% of the visible universe. And so it's thought that there is as much as 95% dark matter and dark energy that we can't see or touch and really have very little idea of what it actually is. Um, and so there's, there's still huge open questions as to what makes up a huge fraction of the universe. Uh, can you talk more about the green tech benefits? Um, so there's, there's a lot of work these days trying to create more environmentally friendly technologies. Um, how, how, do you, how do you harvest energy from, from things um, that are not fossil fuels? So one common way is that everyone seems to be familiar with these days is, is solar cells. How do, you, how do you build a solar cell that's more efficient? Uh, I used to work on these a long time ago. Um, these were a type of solar cell that you could that you could build very very inexpensively. They were not 
very efficient, but they were super, super cheap. And that was the advantage of them. And so you can create these solar cells that have um, a certain type of dye on them. That will, the dye will absorb the light and then will transfer that energy, the light energy, into an electric circuit that will power some device. And so um, what I was working on is how do you create some nanoparticles that will absorb the dye uh, to create a more efficient way of absorbing the light. So you, you want a, a nanoparticle that has a lot of surface area around it. So you can put a lot of dye molecules that will absorb, absorb the light. And you also don't, you also want it to be, um, you also want to trap that light. So, so the light hits it and doesn't reflect away. Um, it will reflect onto other particles and other, other dye molecules to absorb that. So there's, uh, those are called dye synthesized solar cells or Gretzel cells sometimes. Um, there's also a lot of work of, of different uh, combinations of new materials that are that can absorb light and create different types of solar cells. Um, but nowadays, even silicon solar cells are becoming pretty efficient and pretty pretty um, uh, inexpensive. And so they've they've really dominated the market. Um, there's other kind of more uh, niche applications. For example, you might create a, a material that when you bend it, when you flex the material, it will generate a small electric voltage. And so maybe you can think of, of clever ways of incorporating that into clothing so that as you move around, uh, your own body movements can generate small amounts of electricity to power some device uh, that you, you carry on your person, or maybe it's built into your smart shirt. Um, maybe you can build that into sidewalks. So when people walk on the sidewalk, they will, they will compress this material and generate, generate electricity. Um, those are kind of exotic applications that come to mind immediately. All right, well, I, I, happy to have you here. So, um, what else can I talk about? These are really good questions. Yes. Um, how can young students become researchers in this space? Well, young students. Well, I would say uh, to do nanoscience work, you know, at, at, the, at the smallest scale would be kind of difficult for a, for a young person just, just because of the, the equipment that's sometimes necessary to, to do that. Um, but it's not entirely outside of the, uh, not entirely impossible. Um, spectroscopy, for example, is, is something that's um, potentially achievable, um, you know, uh, uh, relatively inexpensively, inexpensively with, with common materials. Um, but I, I would say just doing kind of at-home science experiments in general, learning, learning how everything worked. That, that's how I got into it myself. I was very interested in understanding how everything worked. And so I would even do science experiments at home, um, not really nanoscience experiments at the time because I actually didn't even know what that was, but just, uh, uh, just experimenting with things uh, and understanding how, how the world worked. And then eventually I got into nanoscience when I was in college. I was able to work in a professor's laboratory and I got, access to all the fancy equipment. And then I could really, really do some nanoscience there. I got, got a STM and AFM and SEM, um, got all the fancy microscopes. I can grow nanocrystals. So I, I would say just don't worry about any specific field of science. Just, you know, just kind of learn as much as you can, do as many experiments as you can. Um, and as you progress through uh, school, you'll, you'll eventually uh, be able to do more and more advanced things. Unless you have a specific uh, idea in mind of how I might be able to um, advise you. Uh, what is a nanocrystal? So a nanocrystal is a very, very small crystal. So you might think of, um, let's say a diamond, like in a diamond, a diamond ring, right? So that's a crystal. That's a crystal made of carbon, actually. Uh, all the carbon atoms are arranged in a very specific ordered pattern that just so happens to be the, the diamond, diamond crystal um, lattice. Uh, and you know, unless you're super, super rich, that, that crystal is probably you know, on the order of you know, the size of your pinky finger or maybe smaller. 
Um, um, but nevertheless, that would be a relatively large crystal, macroscopic crystal, something you could see very easily with your hand. You can create very small crystals, um, nano crystals, down to the sizes of uh, a few hundred nanometers. And you can even have nano diamonds. That these are now too small to see with your naked eye, but are nevertheless the same ordered arrangement of carbon atoms, just really, really small. Uh, far fewer atoms make up that crystal. And so um, uh, there are a lot of applications crystals, uh, and we call them nanocrystals. You can grow nano diamonds, you can grow uh, nano gold, uh, for example, is another, another common one. Um, you know, all sorts of different crystals of different materials. And it just depends on, on what exactly you're trying to do, the, uh, what you're studying, the point of the experiment as to why you might grow one crystal over another crystal. Uh, some, of the, some of the nanocrystals I was, I was using a long time ago were zinc oxide nanocrystals. Zinc oxide is in some types of sunscreen. So you'll, you know, sunscreen you put in your skin to keep you from getting sunburned. Um, uh, a lot of times that's made up of zinc oxide or titanium dioxide crystals that will really easily absorb light or scatter light. And, but I would grow really, really tiny zinc oxide nanoparticles because in, in my case, they had good electron emitting properties that you could, you could create a little nano electron gun out of these zinc oxide uh, crystals. Uh, so can we make new materials instead of mining them from Earth's resources? Well, you're always going to need the starting, the starting materials that whatever you, whatever you make or grow, uh, you need something to, to, you need the source materials uh, to use. So if you want to make a nanocrystal, um, it's coming to start with a bulk quantity of, of that material. And then you use a very small amount of it and you grow tiny crystals. Um, but you're always going to need to mine, mine something or get, get this starting, getting the source material from somewhere. Um, you're not creating the material out of nothing. You're just um, um, making it smaller or, or dissolving it and reformulating it into a, into a smaller, smaller particle. Is the process energy intensive? Well, it sort of depends on how you're doing it, on what, what process. So some of them might be energy intensive. For example, um, well, okay, so we were talking about diamonds, right? So uh, diamonds maybe are more energy in intensive than, than sometimes because of how they're, they're grown sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes they're grown using a plasma. So a plasma is a, a ionized gas. Um, that you, you strip off some of the electrons and you create this cloud of electrons and positively charged ions and they're floating around the gas. Um, so sometimes you create a plasma and that plasma is used to grow the nanocrystals because they're very energetic and it can, can give the particles the energy they need to, to form what you're trying to make them. And you know that might that might involve a very high voltage. It might take a make, might take a lot of energy to do that. Um, other times it might be very simple. You might just be taking these two solutions of something and mixing them together and stirring it, and uh, you can grow the crystals that way. So it, sometimes it's very complicated. Sometimes it's very simple. It just depends on the material and and um, how small you're trying to make it. What famous or well-known technology is using nanotechnology? Well, the example that I, I think is a, a great application of nanotechnology is in computer chips. Computer, computer chips are fantastically complicated electric circuits, fantastically complicated in terms of um, the density of material and the size of those materials, the incredibly small size of those materials. Uh, they very much rely on nanotechnology. Sometimes the wires that make up a computer chip might only be a few, uh, a few nanometers or a few tens of nanometers in, in one of their dimensions. Um, so incredibly small. Um, the, the, the spacings between that, the, the layers of materials. So computer chips are made up of a lot of different layers, materials layered on top, layered, layered on top of each other. And they have to be very precisely arranged, very precise thickness controls, separation distance controls, everything has to be very, very carefully uh, controlled to get that computer chip to function the way you want it to do. Because if something's out of place, you might get a short circuit or you might get an open circuit where either too much or too little current can flow. Um, everything has to work basically perfectly for that computer chip to function. And the size scales that we're talking about are sometimes just you know, a few nanometers thick, few, few dozen nanometers wide, 
Um, so that's that's an incredibly important application of nanotechnology. Other other applications involve uh, certain types of medicines or or, or um, uh, medical tests where you might want to analyze DNA, for example, maybe the DNA of a new mystery virus is sweeping the earth, right? You want to know the, the genetic sequence that makes up that, that DNA inside the virus. And so that's another application of how do you read that DNA? How do you extract it? How do you read it? How do you sequence it to know all the different parts that, that make up the, the strand of DNA? Um, you, can, you can use nanotechnology in, in, um, in maybe maybe conceptually simpler ways of you can just mix in different nanomaterials into another material to change its properties. So one application is in rubber tires that you can mix in little flakes of graphene, for example. So, some company does this. They mix in mixing graphene into the rubber and they claim that, that that gives the rubber different properties, more desirable properties. I, I haven't used these tires myself, but that's what this company claims. Um, so you can, you can mix the nanomaterials in and create um, mixtures with, that have more desirable properties depending on what you mix in and the concentrations. Um, there are there are ways that you can make color with nanotechnology different than um, with dyes. So for example, you might dye a shirt a certain color and there are going to be dye molecules that, that bind to the the cotton or the material that makes up the shirt and will absorb different colors of light. But it's possible to create color not with absorbing, absorbing light with dye, but just based on the structure of the material. You can pattern something with little rough features, grooves or, or um, um, texture in just such, a, just such a way that it will basically reflect all the light that you don't, uh, reflect only the light that you want to, to reflect. And so you can make something appear a certain color just based on the, the nanostructure, the texture of that material. And this is actually possible even naturally. There are certain types of butterflies that their wings are structured in such a way. They have these little tiny scales that are nanoscale um, uh, sizes that will reflect a uh, very specific color of blue light. And it gives the, the butterfly this, this, this color um, that's not based on absorbing light with dyes, but rather the structure of the wing. What do you like about your work? What is fun about nanoscience? I really like understanding how, every, how everything works. And I thought that, that physics and nanoscience was one really great way to, to answer a lot of my questions about some of the smallest practical building blocks of, of, of matter. You know, how do atoms work? How do molecules work? I can, I can see and, and do experiments with individual atoms and molecules. And then uh, combining those things together into a little bit more complicated structures, these nanostructures, nanocrystals, and, and so forth, um, it really gives me insight into a whole different world than what I'm used to at, at the everyday scale. Uh, at the nanoscale, things behave differently than they do at, at the macroscopic scale where you can see and touch with your hands. Um, for example, gold nanoparticles are not gold colored, they're red, just because of certain um, electronic properties uh, change when you make that gold particle really, really small. Things might become much better conductors at, at small scales. Uh, because you're removing defects, for example. Uh, things might become more flexible when you make them incredibly, incredibly thin. Um, so there's a host of different properties that come out at the nanoscale, and we like to understand what those properties are and how we can use them to our advantage to create practical devices, for example. Or for me, the draw is just to understand the, the fundamental workings of the universe at that scale. So I think that's, I think that's really cool uh, to be able to study that. We get to play with a lot of really cool toys, uh, all those instruments I was talking about at the beginning, I think are really fascinating to use. Um, and there's there are certain practical aspects of the job. Like it, it, it tends to be, um, it allows you to express your creativity of how you want to go about designing an experiment and, and tackling that problem. How do you, how do you, how do you solve a problem? How do you, how do you overcome some challenge and design your experiment in a certain, in a certain way? And when it works, you're the first person in the world to understand that. You're the first person to know something. And you get to tell everybody else what you've learned. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, 
we've reached the bottom of the hour, guys. And I want to thank Dr. Swartz for that fantastic presentation. I learned a lot today. <laughs> and uh, and we and you guys were great. Uh, you had some really good questions. And um, and that makes it even better when when you have that type of participation. So I really appreciate, and I'm surprised we didn't get come back around to you before now, because it's been a couple of years um, since we had you the first time. So we won't do that again. <laughs> we would, <laughs> we're gonna uh, keep you in rotation to come sooner the next time, but we appreciate you taking an hour out of your day and all of you guys the same. Um, we thank you um, without them. You know, we couldn't have STEM Friday. So um, thanks for everybody. And you guys have a great weekend. If you need to ask uh, Dr. Schwartz any questions that you might think of after the call, um, you can, uh, you want to put your contact information in the chat, um, Dr. Schwartz, or you can just contact me. And sure, or you could forward it, forward it around to the group. Yeah, yeah, I can, I'll do that. I'll, uh, anybody that needs to get in touch with him, just see me and um, I'll make sure that he gets the information. But you guys have a good evening and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah, I enjoyed talking with you all today and answering your questions. I, I think that science in general is just such a, such a fun activity. Um, so many very brilliant people, men and women from all around the world get to participate and help each other and Learn, learn these amazing things and do these awesome experiments. So I, I, yeah. have, I was really happy to talk to you about it today and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. It, it was. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. All right. Have All a right, good guys. evening, everyone. Have a good one.